Talia Stroud and Eli Pariser. Um, they will talk about how to improve digital space. They will give us an overview of the work they've been doing over the past um, two years, focus on how to make thriving communities uh, in digital space. And they will talk to us about what, um, why thinking about a digital space as a concept um, is valuable when thinking about a um, healthy online environment. Um, so no more from me, um, over to you, um, Eli and Talia. Thank you. Talia, do you want to share slides or shall I? Uh, either is fine. Um, all right, let me see if I can. Do you want to, why don't you introduce and I'll get slides up? Okay, okay that sounds great. So oh. hi everyone, I'm Talia Stroud. Um, and we're really excited to have the opportunity to share with you some of the work that we've been doing over the past uh, two years now, thinking about digital spaces and how they might be more flourishing or, or better spaces. And what we'd like to share with you today is first a bit about kind of the philosophy behind what we've done, and then we'll move quickly into some of the uh, results of what we've done over the past couple of years. Um, so I'll just say uh, I'm a faculty member at the University of Texas at Austin, and I co-direct Civic Signals uh, with Eli. And hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Eli Pariser. Um, I've done various kind of projects at the intersection of uh, technology and democracy and media, um, ran Move On for a while in the United States uh, and helped co-found Vaz, and then uh, wrote a book called The Filter Bubble. And um, now I've been thinking about how to build better digital spaces with Talia. And the, the research that we'll share with you today, it, the hope is that it'll start an important conversation about what is good and what would we want out of digital spaces. We hope that this at least provides a starting point for evaluating whether or not existing platforms are doing well or are doing poorly with respect to creating flourishing digital spaces. And then finally, we hope that it's a roadmap for existing platforms and new advent, uh, new startups or new nonprofit entities uh, to take this and really run with it when they're designing new spaces. Ah. So um, before we share with you the framework that we've developed, um, we wanted to share a little bit of the theory of kind of how we got here. And I think um, we started with this observation that um, when it comes to kind of physical communities, public spaces, places like parks and libraries and town squares play this really critical and kind of un under heralded role. They knit uh, societies together and they're the places where people can come into contact with uh, people and ideas that are different from them, make arguments about how things should be, um, and develop a sense of kind of community identity. And so without spaces where publics come together, you know, societies pull apart. And so we're trying to put that observation together with the fact that where public life is happening is really different. And um, well, public spaces have existed since the very first human settlements, um, you know, more and more of our public life lives in private, um, you know, electronic media, um, places like Facebook and Twitter and TikTok. And it, in some ways, these act like public spaces, but they weren't built or designed to serve public goals. And so I think, um, Part of what we're trying to think about is how do we how do we come to serve those needs so um what's interesting is when we start thinking about how we could apply the lessons of physical public spaces to digital public spaces it turns out that it's a really rich um analogy and uh you know what what we find is that First off, when we start thinking about uh, spaces instead of kind of information exchange as our metaphor for what we're trying to build, it's just, it recontextualizes behavior from something that is primarily like the exchange of facts between people 
And all of the ways that when you imagine people in a space, um, all of the nonverbal behavior, all of the group behavior, the dynamics between different groups um, becomes much more vivid. And so we think that's really helpful. But there are also a bunch of just kind of concrete lessons that we realized um, you know, digital space making can learn from physical place making. And um, those vary from, so for example, um, you know, most flourishing physical places have this kind of uh, programming capacity. So it's not just let's build a bandstand, it's let's figure out how to actually have musicians play on the bandstand so that we're bringing out a bunch of the different constituencies that we want to use this space. Um, there are visual cues about what the norms might be. Um, and, uh, you know, there's accessibility. So how do we design this in a way that lots of different people can participate? And critically, there are people, stewards or leaders or maintainers who kind of do the labor of knitting communities together and helping make sure that spaces are hospitable and safe. Um, and often these physical public spaces are designed in partnership with communities that use them. So when we thought about this, there were a couple of different observations that we made that we think lay the groundwork for what we'll share with you momentarily. And the first is that in a lot of digital platforms, the design is based on user-friendly design. It's really thinking about how do you maximize the experience of an individual person. And so many things involve this individual focus, like A-B testing, which one of these options is going to make someone stay on the site longer. But what we were noticing is that no one's really thinking so much about public friendly design, which is actually quite different to design for societies and communities and for allowing people to work together. And so this is really our point of departure is thinking about things from a public friendly design perspective, as opposed to a user friendly individual focused design perspective. And the reason to do so um, on the next slide is that these can also be in tension with one another where a user friendly design approach would in fact be distinct from a public friendly design approach. So if we want to take a user friendly design way of thinking about things, you might want to optimize for individual well being. And if you play that out, well, perhaps what some individuals really want out of these spaces is to share uh, uh, content with friends and family and maybe the type of content is polarizing and racially charged. And maybe the effect of this then is more tribalism and polarization. So this is an example of where user-friendly design and public-friendly design, in fact, come into conflict with one another. And this is the reason that we think it's quite important for us to not only focus on individual well-being, but we also have to be thinking about, are we designing spaces for communities and societies to flourish? And when we're going down this path, we wanna be really clear that there's been incredible research looking at the negative components of what's happening in digital spaces, like getting rid of misinformation, like really addressing hate speech. This is incredibly important work. And we, are, we, we see ourselves as articulating a vision that, that's in parallel with uh, what those scholars and activists and designers are focused on. And essentially what we're saying here is let's focus on the positive indicators. Let's find out what makes for a good flourishing digital space. And we use the, the, the following to kind of get our head in the space, which is just as exercise is as important to heart health as cholesterol medication, increasing the positive qualities of a space might help mitigate the negative ones. So the research approach that we took is we interviewed a whole bunch of people. Uh, we reviewed lots of literature and research. We tried to be as diverse as we possibly could in doing this. Uh, although, of course, there's always more work to be done. Uh, we conducted focus groups in five different countries. And we also fielded a survey across 20 different countries with over 20,000 people to try to really figure out what makes a good, positive, quality digital experience. We also, so in the process of that, um, we, we identified <coughs> a kind of set of building blocks and a set of signals that those that make up those building blocks um, that we'll share with you in a minute. But we also found that actually, you know, some of the language that we use when we talk about these problems um, doesn't totally serve the goal. And so one I'll just pull out here is civility, which is commonly uh, kind of 
often referred to in these conversations about how we bring people together. The more that we looked at how people think about the civility and in what context it comes up, the more that it became clear that um, often civility means kind of ascribing to the dominant norms in a community which are set by the dominant groups in that community. And so it actually can have the effect of requiring lower status people to conform to the norms of higher status people, even when that's not actually fair or egalitarian. And so um, that was one place where we actually, we don't have a signal for civility um, and, and that's purposefully so. Um, the same thing actually with polarization uh, where you know I think our argument is polarization itself is not inherently a problem. It's the dehumanization that accompanies polarization that we really want to get at. And so I think that's just a useful intervention because um, how you solve for dehumanization is different than how you solve merely for like, there are two groups of people who have really differing views. So let's get into the findings. Um, and Talia, I can't actually see which slides, which of us is doing, is this me? Okay, great. Uh, so, um, so after we did all this work, we kind of came up with these 14 signals that were validated by these audiences around the world and um, you know our own literature review. And then we kind of saw that they clustered in these four groups. So there's welcome, connect, understand, and act. And um, you know, our, our uh, argument is that if you're building a flourishing digital public space, um, you may not have all of these signals in the same order, but you'll tend to have these four qualities um, for sure embedded in what you're doing. Oops. And so we're just going to zoom through relatively quickly um, the signals that we've uncovered. And these really we consider to be the qualities that you'd want to aspire to in digital spaces. And these are things that we saw reflected throughout our research. And the first series of four are part of the welcome building block that Eli just mentioned, which is the idea that people really need to feel welcome and invited to this space. Um, they need to be inclusive, especially for marginalized populations. And they really need to help people see the humanization or help people humanize others. So the next building block is um, connect. And with connect, we're not just talking about general connection. I think we've seen, uh, you know, Facebook famously set out to connect the world, but really as we talk to sociologists and political scientists, it turns out that, you know, how you connect makes all the difference. And it's possible to connect two groups of people and find that they are, um, you know, getting to understand each other and, uh, form connections between each other. It's also possible to connect two groups of people and have them come to hate each other even more. And so it's really about what these signals are about is how do you how do you create some uh, some constructive connection, not only uh, which starts with belonging, people generally can't connect, you know, outside of their comfort zone if they don't feel connected uh, to, to, to a group in the in the beginning. So how do you cultivate healthy belonging, and then um, goes to bridging between groups and strengthening connection to both locality and, and power. Uh, the next set of signals are promoting understanding. And this is on not only the basics of providing reliable information, but also how communities co-create knowledge together, how they thoughtfully converse with one another, and how they uh, come to understand what shared concerns are, either for subgroups or for the community as a whole. And finally, there's ACT. Um, and uh, to be clear, this is, you know, it's partly kind of your classic civic action, but it's actually beyond that. Um, when we talk to, uh, to, the, to the social scientists, one of the things that they really pointed out was that, um, you know, there's something about people coming together to collaborate and build something together that is is just incredibly effective at creating kind of social trust, a shared identity, and a sense of connection that then facilitates all of the rest of these signals over again. So um, when people feel powerful together, able to create together, um, you know, kind of starts the whole cycle over again. 
And that's why we thought that it was so important to emphasize this piece as well. And we want to make sure we have time for questions. So I'm going to zoom through this slide a little bit quickly as well. And basically what we did is across 20 countries, we asked people to tell us how important these signals were for a particular platform and whether the platform performed well or performed poorly with respect to that particular signal. And as Eli shared in the chat, there's a lot more detail on all of this later, but on the next um, slide, Eli will give you just a little taste of what the findings are uh, from this survey. So uh, on the website, we've got a lot more to this um, and I put it in the chat, but basically um, one thing we looked at was how super users of given platforms evaluated each platform on these criteria. And so what you can see with Facebook is, um, you know, super users said, okay, it's really important important that Facebook keep people's information secure and show reliable information. They also said, uh, you know, they gave of all of the signals, Facebook, some of the lowest rankings on those two qualities. And so I think it helps illustrate where there are gaps between what uh, folks feel we need from these companies as public uh, goods and what we're actually getting. And it offers some areas for improvement. Yeah, and the wild thing is across all the platforms that we examined and all of the signals that we looked at, we looked at 15 platforms and 14 signals. None of them performed particularly well. There wasn't like, oh, this one platform is an incredible standout around the world that people think that it's performing well. So we think that this is actually a really productive new way to think about what's happening and to evaluate the platform's performance. And we looked at this across uh, age, gender, and different demographic characteristics. We looked at it across country. We looked at it in all sorts of different ways. And our big takeaway is that there's really no one platform that does it all and that different platforms really excel at different signals for different groups and excel should be in quotes here because none of these were performing exceptionally well on any of the signals. So there's lots of room for improvement and we really hope that this framework offers new and uh, up and coming platforms a way to think about digital space and act almost as a checklist, right? Like, are we doing these sorts of things? How could we be better at these at these sorts of signals? And how could we how could we really bake those in from the beginning to any new uh, new platform that we're trying to create? With that, we are so um, delighted to uh, hear more from you with your questions. Thank you very much. Um, we have two questions um, already, and for everyone else, um, do post them um, in, in the chat, and I'll read them out. Um, so one question is, how do you see the role of government and regulation uh, in the signals? Because public spaces are subject to various regulation, um, vehicles, and, and other things. So is there an equivalence that you see in the digital, digital space of that? Yeah, um, it's a great question. And without going on too long, like, I think one of the things that's useful about kind of this model of switching back and forth between referencing physical public space or physical spaces and digital ones is that one of the first things that you notice when you think about physical communities is, okay, there are private uh, or organizations and businesses, and then there are these public entities, libraries and parks and town squares. And there's a reason that libraries aren't constructed as private businesses, which is that, you know, if you were to try to run a library as a VC backed startup, the first thing you would do is fire the librarians and, you know, it would, it, it would very quickly stop being uh, the thing that a library does in society. And so I think our view is, um, you know, we need both of those kinds of institutions. And right now, um, mostly online, we just have this one format of you know, a, a venture-backed startup that we're trying to um, vest with all of these incredibly important public um, functions. And I think our view is you know, they, they can improve on a bunch of these qualities and we should make sure that that happens. But we also probably need some other kinds of institutions over here that are structured in a different way that um, help ensure that the non-market uh, public needs also get met. Thank you. So, and, and that didn't really, I guess, to the regular regulatory point, like that's part of the regulatory project, I would say, is like trying to create the space for this new set of institutions to stand up. Thank you. Um, 
Another question is um, curious to hear about similarity and differences you observed in the different countries um, where you did your research. Uh, great question and so much to say there. We could probably spend hours on that, um, but really briefly I'll share that A, there were interesting patterns that we've seen echoed in public opinion research in the past where some countries and the residents therein were more likely to say that they evaluated things well, that they evaluated things as important, no matter what we asked them. So we saw those same general propensities of people in different countries play out. But we also saw with respect to the signals that there were really interesting things going on here. So as an example, um, for show reliable information, pretty much across all countries, Google super users thought what that was really important for Google, which we might expect, right? But then there are really interesting differences in some places. So um, as an example, uh, Google super users say that the platform tends to perform pretty well with respect to show reliable information, with the exception of um, folks in France and Sweden, as an example, who really thought that Google uh, was only doing an average job with respect to showing reliable information. So there are all sorts of interesting intricacies if you look at this by country across the signals. Um, we have another one on, on the same thing of the country. Um, Jackie uh, asks, as a South African, I'm interested in particular about some of the survey responses from there. What were people saying about the platform use? Particularly interested in these because in many parts of Africa, the proliferation of mobile phones largely features low data phones with WhatsApp and Facebook automatically installed. Um, great question. I'm going to have to refer to the website for a lot more detail uh, on that, where we have uh, uh, we have uh, white papers for every single signal that include data exactly on each country. Uh, the one thing I will say is that we did some uh, focus groups. And there were really interesting observations across, across all of the countries that we looked at. And um, I'm trying to remember, I think it was South Africa in particular, where, where we heard a lot of people sharing stories about using mobile phones uh, for accessing these platforms. So that certainly is reflected in the data that we gathered. Um, do you have any best practice tips on how how to optimize existing platforms for those who want to create communities without creating new platforms? Yeah, um, so I think uh, one of the things that became clear as we thought about this more and talked to people was that, you know, there's, there's definitely a set of these problems that are kind of like tech problems or design problems, they have to do with algorithms. But there's a big chunk of them that are kind of at the people layer or the social layer about how we organize um, communities. And so um, that goes to these questions of like, well, actually, if you look at physical public spaces or digital ones, you know, really a lot of the time what makes them work, what makes them flourish is that there's a, a person or a group of people either whose job it is or who takes on the, the job of making it a welcoming place and stewarding it and you know picking up after people and doing that kind of work and um you know i think uh understanding how much labor goes into the creation of healthy community was definitely one uh really uh, important piece of what we saw so i think that would be part of in terms of best practices like building that in from the get-go and instead of imagining that community will magically sort of um, instantiate itself, um, I think is, is a really important piece. The other one uh, is around uh, the welcome block. And it was just really striking to us, uh, you know, is it, how, how central these questions of like, do I even belong here at all? And is my voice welcome here were for so many people and that many platforms failed to meet that very basic bar of, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm invited to speak here. And so really figuring out how to communicate to each person who joins that they're seen, that they're welcome, that their voice is valued um, is something that, you know, is, is a really strong place to start. And building on that just a little bit, one thing that we've been doing as we've been talking with platforms, and we've been thinking about this more at the design level, but I actually think you could do the same thing when you're thinking about creating communities, is taking a particular signal and asking yourself, what does that look like 
offline. So what does it look like to have a welcoming space offline? And how is that created? And then can you take some of those lessons into a digital space and use those same sort of techniques? Um, we had a digital festival uh, a few weeks back and we were really trying that ourselves by trying to welcome people as they were coming in and you know talking to them as as you would if you were if you were meeting with people people in regular spaces and so I think it's just like a fun way to think about how you could apply the signals whether you're designing something or whether you're creating a community um thanks um there is another question you you touched briefly before but there's another question on on regulation in the sense does this model work as possible framework for regulation or would you prefer a less orchestrated legal ways of improving online spaces? Talia, do you have thoughts on that one? I mean, it's a good question, right? And I feel like so many people internationally are really wrestling with how, how you regulate these sorts of spaces. I think that there are components here that could be useful to think about. So for instance, people really feel that it's important to keep their data secure and there's certainly been regulatory moves in data security. Uh, some of these others I think are a little bit more challenging to do from a regulatory perspective, such as humanizing others, for example. Uh, there may be more regulatory uh, openings there for the negative side of that. And certainly that's the case in some countries. Um, but I, I think that there's, there's more to be done here by evaluating how well the platforms are doing, even as a citizenry or as an organization like New Public, um, really thinking through, uh, are, are they meeting these goals and how well are they doing so? So uh, a mi mixed answer there. I think some of these uh, may provide the foundation for some regulatory frameworks, but I don't think that the full uh, battery of these is, is amenable to just taking this whole the whole thing and moving it into a regulatory space. But Eli, you may feel differently, so please feel welcome to jump in. No, I mean, I, I guess I was imagining, like, I think there's a way in which the parallel is, you know, do you want regulation about parks to determine how parks are designed? And I think the question is, like, you, you don't want the aesthetics to be, you know, or the fundamentals to be regulated from the top down, but you probably do want to say this has to be accessible. It has to be environmentally safe and secure. And by the way, we need to have uh, resources to make it work and a parks department. And so I sort of think like it, it offers direction, but you probably don't want to prescribe exactly how folks uh, are creative within those within those constraints. And because we have an audience of also journalists, um, what would be the lessons for journalism and the role of media in a healthy digital public space? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. And as we've gone throughout this project, we were focusing so much on these digital spaces, but I think a lot of these lessons apply to journalism as well. And uh, indeed, we've had some fun thinking about what have journalistic organizations done with respect to these signals? How have they, in fact, uh, humanized others or welcomed people? And I think there's actually a lot of lessons here for journalism and that journalism has paved the way in some of these uh, arenas on how you, can, how you can enact these sorts of principles in reporting, in even creating journalistic digital spaces. There are so many news organizations now that are uh, creating online spaces for their for their own audiences. And so I think that there's a there's actually, I think, substantial overlap and a lot of lessons to be learned, both for social media and journalism through this framework. We have time for one last question. Um, which existing digital platforms um, for you seems to offer the most welcoming, connecting, understanding digital public space you've experienced so far? Go ahead. It's a good question. Um, you know, I think, I don't think there's a platform that to me feels like it's nailed all of this or even most of it. Um, you know, I would say um, the two, the two that I feel like have some interesting like approaches. Uh, one is LinkedIn, weirdly, um, which I just think has the benefit of um, it feels like a workplace so it can draft on workplace norms and people even dress up in their little like workplace clothes for 
their their photo. Um, but I think that actually is really helpful to people and like, oh, this is the kind of space this is, and therefore this is the kind of behavior that's okay here. And it's not to say that it's perfect, but it's to say that um, there are some norms and some clarity about what, what is expected. Um, the other I would point to is Reddit, um, which obviously has some huge problems with toxicity, but also in terms of the structure of it, community, its communities offers more power to people who are convening a community to explain what the norms are and to hold people to them than some other platforms. And I think that's a really valuable um, set of tools. What about Talia, do you have a? Uh, the only thing I would add is there are also some interesting startups. One that we, uh, we've been curiously following is Front Porch Forum out of Vermont. And it's a very local network uh, where communities and neighborhoods are connected to one another. Uh, it's very heavily moderated, but it's an interesting case study, albeit on a much smaller scale than some of these platforms are operating, but it's one worth checking out, I think. 